الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربك عبد زكريا إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا قال رب إني وهنى العظم مني واشتعل الرأس شيبا ولم أكن بدعائك ربي شقيا وإني خفت الموالي من ورائي وكانت مراتي عاقرا فهب لي من لدنك وليا يرثني ويرث من آل يعقوب واجعله رب رضيا يا زكريا إنا نبشرك بغلام اسمه يحيي لم نجعل له من قبل سميا قال رب أنا يكون لي غلام وكانت امرأتي عاقرا وقد بلغت من الكبر عتيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين وقد خلقتك من قبل ولم تكن شيئا قال رب اجعل لي آية قال آياتك ألا تكلم الناس ثلاث ليال سويا فخرج على قومه من المحراب فأوهى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله We thank the Almighty Allah for blessing us with such a wonderful day We thank him for his mercies that he's bestowed upon us. We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah. We also bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Today, I believe is... Excuse me. <clears throat> Today is the 13th day of Ramadan, 1,441 years after the hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which also corresponds with the seat May 2020. We are still in our Ramadan series. We are still, you know, trying to find lessons that we are going to inculcate in our lives in this Ramadan and then for the future as well. For the past three, four days, we've been speaking about the Quran exclusively. And uh, yesterday we touched about the definition of the Quran where we said the Quran was Kalamullah al mujiz the word of the almighty allah that is miraculous so today we are going to look at the miracles of the quran but before that uh, uh one of our sisters sent us some questions that we'll look at them for a few minutes before we continue Wa alaikum salam. how are you it's been a while why have you been hiding uh let me look for the question and then we answer the question before we continue she said uh the question is some people who are knowledgeable are treating most those who are not so knowledgeable like some form of failures instead of trying to guide them where she is there is a community where who do that a lot when they meet people who can't communicate in arabic and ask questions 
Like, how are you then a Muslim? You can't speak Arabic. How are you then a Muslim? Some of us can read the Quran, but honestly, like you explain, we don't understand what we read, but there is still an opportunity to learn. So it's better they encourage us instead of making us feel we are not Muslims enough. So the I talked yesterday about you know learning your religion. And if you're not well versed in the religion, don't come and talk about issues concerning the religion. Yes, that still stands. But then the fact that you are learned in the religion doesn't make other people rags doesn't make other people stupid or foolish your knowledge in the religion should be a beacon of hope for others who are not more knowledgeable who are not as knowledgeable as you are in the religion so that they will emulate you so that you will be a source of hope a source of guidance for them instead of looking down upon them look at them they don't know anything about the religion foolish people no no not at all don't ever, ever feel that because you are knowledgeable, other people are worthless. That is what, in the first place, sent shaitan into Almighty Allah's punishment and chastisement. He said, I'm better than him. That's what shaitan said about Adam. He said, Ana minhu. I am better than him. Min nar. You created me from fire. Wa min teen. You created him from clay, soil. How can he be better than me? Never. It can never happen. So if the Almighty Allah has given you any form of knowledge, especially Islamic knowledge, the first thing that it must, you know, that it must build in you is humility. Is very, very important. And that, my sister, is the bane of scholarship, especially Islamic scholarship. The Achilles heel of Islamic scholarship is pride and pomposity. And that is what is killing us, especially young scholars like myself who are up and coming. Because we've had the opportunity, because people follow us, because people respect us and admire us, Instead of us coming down and then being normal like everybody else, then, no, we won't do that. We'd rather feel that, yes. The Almighty Allah to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi He said, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you had been hard-hearted, if you had been pompous, if you had been that big, they will have run away and left you the Sahaba. Like him, Shawirun fil Amr. Sit with them, discuss with them, eat with them. The Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet, but then he consults his Sahaba on issues. The Battle of Badr, when the Prophet Muhammad and his Sahaba camped at a place, a man, a Sahaba, a young, a, a, an unknown Sahaba, came and then he asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, this place that we've come to, is it wahi from Allah? Is it Allah who had revealed to you that let's come here or it is out of your own tactics, warfare tactics? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, oh, it is out of warfare tactics. He said, okay, then I have a suggestion. You see the wells over there? Why don't you go and camp in front of the wells? The wells are behind us. We are in front of the well. When we are fighting the wars and then the war becomes heat, at the heat of the war, we will have access to water. But then if we come here and then there is no water next to us, and then the kufar come and then they come in front of the waters, we will be at a disadvantage. They are more in number than us, and then they will get access to water. This is a normal sahabi who came and then he gave an opinion, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa didn't tell him, okay, shut up, who are you? I, Prophet, I'm speaking, you are talking. No, he doesn't like that. So those of us who have studied, let's take our time. We are doctors. We must get closer to the people and explain things to them. The second question my sister had was, 
what is the right way to dispose of torn or damaged sheets from the holy quran the scholars have given two solutions if you have your quran that is old you know damaged the sheets are torn it is no longer you know usable what will you do with it the scholars have given two opinions one opinion is that you bury it the other opinion is that you burn it but then through my research, I, I stumble upon evidence supporting you will burn it. As for the burying, I'm not saying it's not authentic, but I have not come across any evidence on that. So if you're listening, you have any evidence that supports that, no problem. But then the evidence that I have concerning that is burning it because during the time of Uthman bin Affan, all the Quranic manuscripts that were wrong, that were not according to the one that was written after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered them to be burnt because they were no longer in use. So it's a work or it's something from the Salaf from Uthman bin Affan, radiyallahu anhu. So that's to do with those two questions. The first question was, if you're knowledgeable, don't make other people feel useless, rather encourage them, rather teach them, rather bring them closer. So those of us who are struggling to also learn the religion, let's continue to do so let's not let naysayers you know pull us back or drag us back it's a communication or it's a relationship between us and almighty allah that we are trying to perfect we are not doing it for anybody so if anybody becomes a stumbling block let's jump over the person and then move on because yes there are some people who because they are knowledgeable they make you feel worthless they make you feel as if you are an animal which is not right in islam Yes, this is what caused Shaitan. Shaitan thought he was knowledgeable, he was best, and then he 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 despised Adam and then he called Adam names, and then that is what led him to being in that situation. So uh let's not let's not look down upon people all because we feel we are better than them. In Akramakum in the the most noble amongst you is the one who fears Allah more than anybody else. But knowledge is very, very important. But then don't let it be a tool for you to feel proud or pompous or looking down on other people. Maybe today might be the last day we'll speak about the Quran, but as you can see, I have a couple of papers here more. Some notes that I've jotted down concerning the Quran. And today we are going to look at the miraculous nature of the Quran. The miracles of the Quran. Do Muslims believe in miracles? Definitely, we believe in miracles. Yes. <laughs> this is a kind of worms I'm going to be in here. Do we believe in miracles? Yes, we believe in miracles. As a general statement. But then whose miracles do we believe in? That's where the problem is. Whose miracles do we believe in? Because we live in a time whereby charlatans are abound. They sent us Fed requests. They have billboards and and stuff like that. So who, whose miracles are we going to believe in? For us, we believe that there are men of God that the Almighty Allah has given some special powers. Human beings, yes, that have been given some powers. That they themselves sometimes do not know that they have those powers. And the Almighty Allah uses them to, to do some, you know, miraculous and magnificent things. And anytime those magnificent things are going to happen, it's not as if they choose for it to happen. It is Almighty Allah that does it through them. So this is the difference between a pious man being miraculous and then a charlatan being miraculous. A charlatan in his miracles, he calls people, come, I can help you. I can save you. I can open the doors. I can do this. I can do this, then he's a charlatan. Because the prophets that were sent, they didn't come and sit the people in the community and say, okay, come, I'm come to do this for, for you. Come, I'm going to show you this miracle. No. The miracles happen when the community asks for them or when they are in that situation and needs and then the miracle will happen. Like the miracle of Musa, the separation of the Red Sea. Musa didn't tell Bani Israel, come, let's go to the Red Sea, I'll split it open. He didn't know it would even happen. When they were at the banks of the Red Sea and then there was no boats to cross and then Pharaoh was coming with his soldiers, that is when the Almighty Allah said, Fa'awhayna ila Musa And then we revealed to Musa, hit the sea. 
So Ibn Taymiyyah has a very nice book on this, the differences between the awliya of Allah and then the awliya of shaitan. Is there? It's not something you want to touch about. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did miracles, yes. But then the Quran is the eternal miracle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you see, those other miracles, the people who, the, the other miracles that the other prophets had, they were visible to the people who were living at that time. Even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had miracles that was visible to the people of his time. The people of the Kufar of Makkah asked him to split the moon into two. The Almighty Allah tells us, Iqtarabati sa'atu wa shakkal qamar. The time is near, the hour is near, Qiyamah is near, with the splitting of the moon. The Kufar of Makkah asked him, that can he split the moon? He asked the Almighty Allah, and the Almighty Allah split the moon into two. They saw it with their own eyes that the moon has been split into two. But then they said, mm -mm -mm, Muhammad, you, your, Muhammad, your magic is too strong. Hey, so this your magic is so strong to the extent that you can even split the moon that we are seeing. You split the moon. They didn't believe. So all the visible miracles that these prophets performed, not everybody believed in them. Even those at their time, not everybody believed in them. But then, this miracle of the Quran is the eternal miracle of the Prophet Muhammad It has passed through the ages. It has come to us through generations upon generations upon generations upon generations, and then it is here with us. Isn't it a miracle? A book by an unlettered person living in an unlettered community whose major form of transmission of information and knowledge is by memory, wrote memorization. But then they were able to memorize this thing. And then this thing remained, you know, important and credible up to this time. And then 2 billion people adhered to it. And there is no book in the world that has the number of memorizers that this book has memorized that this book has been memorized this is a miracle if there's anything called a miracle then this is a miracle so the quran we all know has 30 different splits juzo 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 we have a 30. we have 114 chapters in the quran we have 6,666 verses in the Quran according to some calculations. Ahlul Kufa, Ahlul Kufa, Al Kufiyun, they say the Quran has 6,236 verses. It's not as if they reduce or they edit, they, they, they deleted some of the verses. No. They joined some of the verses. I hope you understand. For example, when you say for lil musallin in some you know calculations for lil musallin is a verse. Alladina hum an salatim sahun is another verse. But in another narration, for lil musallin alladina hum an salatim sahun, they join them. So that is why Alul Kufa they had a lesser number of verses in the Quran as compared to the rest. It is not as if they deleted some of the verses. So you don't come and say, ah, how is it that Ahlul Kufa have 6,236 verses and then the rest of the Jumhur have 6,636 verses? Didn't they delete anything in the Quran? They didn't delete. They just joined some of the verses to make it, uh, they joined some of the verses to make it one verse instead of two verses. That's how they arrived at 6,236 6, verses. The Quran has some things in them. The, the orders in the Quran, do's, the do's and do's, do's in the Quran are 1,000 verses. You find 1,000 verses in the Quran talking about do's, do, do. You also have 1,000 verses talking about don'ts, don't, 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 1,000. And then you find another 1,000 verses giving good news, good news, good news, 1,000 verses. You have another 1,000 verses giving warning. Hey, be careful. Be careful. Chastisement, punishment, 1,000. 
you have stories and history in the Quran. Yes, there is history in the Quran. There are stories in the Quran. You have another 1,000 verses speaking about that. Lessons in the Quran. Lessons that you can pick. You have 1,000 verses talking about lessons in the Quran. Al-Halal and Haram is only 500 verses. Halal and Haram in the Quran is 500 verses. Ad-Dua, prayer in the Quran has taken 100 verses. So if you observe, do's 1,000. Don'ts 1,000. Good news 1,000. Warnings 1,000. That's 4,000. Al-Qisas wal-Akhbar, historical events, another 1,000. That's 5,000. Uh, what did we say? Uh, Shekhana, <laughs> Jazakallah, Shekhana. This is my Sheikh, and if I say my Sheikh, he is my Sheikh. I studied under him, Sheikh Kamil. I studied under him, I still study under him since when since I was weaned. Yes, since I, I, I stopped taking breast milk, I was studying under him until now, and for someone like him to wash us here and then pray for us alhamdulillah we know we are doing something good jazakallah khairan al husn al riya wa tarbiya jazakallah khairan so you had 5000 verses now al ibar wal amthal which is you know lessons from the quran lessons specific stories or examples or lessons and another 1000 that is 6000 now we've had the 6000 Al halal wal haram is 500 verses, so 6,500. Ad dua, 100 verses, so 6,600. Where is the rest of the 66? Because we said that Jumhur said the Quran has 6,666 verses. Now, if you had 6,600 verses, according to you know these classifications that we've done, and Nasi Khwal Mansur is something we call abrogation in the Quran. Where the Almighty Allah reveals a verse and then he later changes the verse. It is a whole course on its own. Manansakh min ayatin aw nun siha na'ti bi khayri minha aw mithliha. An-nasikh wal mansukh. 66 verses in the Quran complete an-nasikh wal mansukh. So we have 6,666 verses of the Holy Quran. Alhamdulillah. The Quran was revealed in in Arabic language, as we said, the first verse we said was Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. We agreed on that. We discussed that in the past lectures. The last verse was the verse in Surah Al Baqarah, verse 282, where the Almighty Allah said, Wa yawman fihi ila Allah. Fear the moment or the day that you're going to return to the Almighty Allah. Ibn Abbas said, This verse was revealed. After nine days, the Prophet Muhammad died. But then the verse, Al Yoma Akmal to Lakum Dina Kum Watamam to Alekum Nirmati, it was revealed on the ninth day of Arafah, on ninth day of Zulhijjah, Hijjah, on Arafah, in the tenth year of Hijrah, three months before the Prophet Muhammad died. It is not the last verse, but then that verse indicated something that Islam had been completed, and after that verse, no new law was revealed. Any law that came after the revelation of this verse was just a repetition and a reminder for the community. So with tahqiq, what the scholars of tafsir and hadith have unanimously agreed upon is that is the last verse to be revealed in the Quran according to the hadith of Ibn Abbas who said this verse was revealed after this verse was revealed Exactly nine days later, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, and the verse itself was talking about returning to the Almighty Allah, death, and then recompense. Let's look at some of some of the names of the Quran. Yes, the Quran has names. Imam Zarqashi in his book Al Burhan named fifty-five names of the Quran. Fifty-five names of the Quran, Imam Zarqashi, in his book Al Burhan, Fi Ulum Al Quran, fifty-five names. Ibn Al Qayyim in his book At Tibyan listed ninety names of the Quran. We can't mention all of them. Ninety names. Ibn Al Qayyim, Imam Ibn Al Qayyim. 
wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh nizamuddin you can see a brother has just commented in arabic but then his name is in some language that you might not understand this is bangladesh very wonderful people they are hosting me here in detroit alhamdulillah so imam ibn al-qayyim in his book at-tibyan mentions 90 names of the quran but Imam Zarqashi in his book Al-Burhan mentions 55 names of the Quran. The Quran can be called Al-Quran. That is the most popular name of the Quran, Al-Quran. And it is mentioned in the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah verse 184, the Almighty, or 185, the Almighty Allah says, Shahur Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. It is in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed. Al-Quran. The Quran is also called Al-Dhikr. When you come to the word Al-Quran, the scholars have given two different opinions concerning the meaning of the word Al-Quran. Some of them said it's from the root word Qara'a, which means to read. So it's a reading material. Others to say it is from the root word Qarana, to join. So the words were joined together. So Makrun and it was joined. So Quran can mean from Qara'a or Qarana. But then the authentic one is Qara'a, read. Adhikr means the reminder. Part of the names of the Quran, Adhikr meaning the reminder. Inna nahnu nazalna dhikr. Verily, it's I, the Almighty Allah, who has revealed or sent down the reminder. Wa inna lahu la hafizun, and we are going to protect it. Al Furqan. Al Furqan means the criteria that differentiates between truth and falsehood. So a whole chapter in the Quran is even called Al-Furqan. Tabarak al-ladhi nazzal al-Furqan ala abdihi liyakuna il-alamina nadira. So glory be to the Almighty Allah who sent down the Furqan, the criteria for it to serve as a reminder for the whole of humanity, for the whole universe. Another popular name of the Quran is Al-Kitab, which means the book. The very second verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. This is a book that there is no doubt in it, a guidance for those who fear the Almighty Allah. We've seen this. Now let's go straight forward into the miracles or the miraculous nature of the Quran. The first miraculous nature of the Quran is, <laughs> maybe this might not be what you're expecting, it's Ijaz al Bayani. The message of the Quran is in it, the message itself, the component of the message itself is, is, is miraculous. Ibn Abi Mulaikata narrated for us that during the time of Umar bin Khattab, an Arab man came and then he asked that someone should read for him the Quran. And then the person read for him the first part of Surah to Tawbah, the ninth chapter of the Holy Quran. And then he read for him, وَأَذَانُ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمِ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولِهِ Thank you very much. Uh, the Ali Ibrahim you see here is my uncle, my mother's younger brother. He's my mother's younger brother. He's my direct uncle. Alad Labaran, how are you doing? The verse Surah to Tawbah, verse 3, where it says, Wa adhanu min Allahi wa rasulihi ila nasi yawm al hajjil akbar. Anna Allah bari'un min al-mushrikina wa rasooluh. That is what the verse says. Wa rasooluh. The verse means that, and it is an announcement from Allah and his messenger to the people assembled on the day of the great pilgrimage that Allah and his messenger dissolve treaty obligations with the pagans or that the almighty Allah turns away, is disassociating. The Almighty Allah and the Prophet are disassociating themselves from the non-Muslims, from the pagans. That is what the verse means. The Almighty Allah and the Prophet have disassociated themselves from the Mushrikeen. But then the person who read the verse 
said anna allaha bari'u min al-mushrikina wa rasuli instead of wa rasulu the moment he said anna allaha bari'u min al-mushrikina wa rasuli it means the almighty allah has disassociated himself from his prophets and then the mushrikeen but then when you say wa rasulu in this verse it means allah and the prophet have disassociated themselves from the mushrikeen so it's very very important you learn to read the quran very well otherwise you change the meaning and then you'll be talking about something else totally that is the magnificence of the arabic language and then in the quran too so when you say anna allah bari'un min al mushrikeen wa rasuli it means the almighty allah has disassociated himself with his prophet he has ostracized or isolated his prophet this statement itself is a kufr statement it's a statement of disbelief but then the right verse is anna allah bari'un min al mushrikeen wa rasulu so if you are reading the quran you need to read it very well take your time and read it very well i think my my azan is he doesn't want to where is it uh-huh thank you very much so this arab guy this bedouin from the village when he came to medina and then he asked someone to read the quran for him because of his natural you know disposition as an arab man and he understands the arabic language he said ah, so if allah is disassociating himself from his prophet me too i don't like the prophet and then umar bin khattab was given the information he said arabi why is it why is that you're saying you don't like the prophet you're disassociating yourself with the prophet he said i came to medina and i asked this man to read the quran for me i don't know the quran and then he read wa adhanu min allah wa adhanu min allah wa a'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim anna allah bari'u min al mushrikeen wa rasulih that allah has disassociated himself from the mushrikeen and his prophet and umar told him no what the verse really is anna allah bari'u min al mushrikeen wa rasuluh and that the almighty allah and his messenger have disassociated themselves from the mushrikeen so it becomes very very important here that you need to also understand nahw before you understand the quran very well as i said that you need to study the arabic language because without the study of the arabic language you can say anna allah bari'u min al mushrikeen wa rasulihi and then you will not know that you've said something wrong so ijaz al bayani the quran is a treasure of 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 realities a sea full of pearls a tower of gold it is the teacher of teachers it has detailed you know uh, m- methodology the methodology of the quran is very detailed the message and the language is sweet and then it is from a, 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 i don't know how to explain this the quran is on a different level the origin or the source of the quran is enough for it to be for its miraculous nature the origin of the quran alone is enough for us to close shop today and then understand that it is a miraculous book because it's from the almighty allah it is the word of the almighty allah as we have always been saying and then understand one thing the importance and the level of the quran over any other message over any other book over any other statement is like the reverence and the importance of the almighty allah on all of us because it's the word of the almighty allah and there is nothing that comes close to the quran nothing 
There is nothing in any literature, whoever has written it, that comes closer to the Quran. There is nothing like that. There is no book that you read that is better than the Quran. There is nothing that you read that will get closer to the Quran. There is nothing at all. It is the Quran and then the Quran because it is the word of the Almighty Allah. So if you say that there is another word or another statement better than the Quran, does it mean that the author of that statement is better than Allah? Is that the question you are asking us? Or is that the question you are really ready to answer? You know the kuffar, Thank you, Yusuf. Jazakallah khairan. Ibn Abi Shayba and Imam, Munah, na, Imam Al-Hakim and Abu Nu'aym narrates for us a hadith from Jabir ibn Abdullah. Utba to Ibn Rabia Abu Walid in the company of the Kuffar in Mecca they said, why don't we go and debate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Utba to said, don't worry, I'll go and debate him. Utba left and then he went to the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam welcomed him. This guy is a kafir. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam welcomed him. And then he told him, Ma wara'aka ya Abul Walid. What do you have? Why are you here, ya Abul Walid? You're welcome. He didn't call him Utba. He called him Abul Walid out of respect. And the Arabs, when they want to respect someone, they call him by his kunya. Thank you very much, Shaykh. 1441, not 4, 1141. Uh, 1141, that is 300 years ago. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, when we are done, I will thank you very much for the correction, Shaykh. So, what about Ibn Rabia told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, you know, we've been with you in Mecca for a while now. You are a good boy. We all love you. as sadiqul Amin. We always bring our, you know, you know, cherish valuables for safekeeping with you. But then recently, I don't know what has happened. You've changed completely. You are making statements that are malicious towards us. You've brought confusion between us and our sons and our daughters. Even our slaves are now become rebellious. If it is money that you want, don't worry. We will open the banks and then up, give you all the money in there. If it is, you know, leadership that you want, we will all agree and then we will make you the king of Mecca. If it is a woman that you've seen too, that is why you are bringing this confusion, but you don't know how to approach her. Don't worry, you tell us. Whoever daughter she is, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way and then we'll get you to marry her. And then if you're also sick in the head, let us know so that we'll use all our money at least to look for qualified medical officers so that they will help you to... Because we want you to stop all this. These are, you know, insulting words. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept quiet. After he had done, he said, Awama farakta ya Abul Walid. Are you done, Abul Walid? He said, yes. He's an, he's an isma. Read. And then listen. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read for him Surah of Usilat. Hamim. Tanzeelu min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kitab fussilat ayatuhu Qur'an an arabiyan liqawmi ya'lamun. Bashiran wa nadira fa'arada akhtharuhum fahum la yasma'un. He read and read and read and read. Wallahi, imagine. Imagine the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reading the Quran. You enjoy Sudais and Shuraim, right? You enjoy all these wonderful recitals. Imagine the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reading the Quran and then you are listening to the Quran. The Prophet read and read and read. And then he got to a place where he said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ لَا تَسْجُدُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرُ وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُنَّ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ إِيَّهُ تَعْبُدُونَ And then the Prophet Muhammad fell down and then he prostrated. After he had gotten up, he told him, أَوَقَدْ سَمِيْتَ يَا أَبَلْ وَلِيدُ 
have you heard what I have said? He said, yes. He said, then first now, ma badalak. He said, do whatever you want to do. This is the message I have for you. Abu Walid, after listening to the Quran, just some 38 verses, he came out of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's house, a confused man. As he was walking towards, you know, the conference area where Darul Nadwa, where the Kufar of Mecca normally sit, they said, they looked at him and then they said, we've lost the debate. Abu Wadid left here a very confident man. But look at his face. He's coming back as if chicken has been beaten by the rain. So they told him, yes, Abu Walid, what message do you have for us from Muhammad? He said, لَقَدْ سَمِئْتُ مِنْ مُحَمَّدٍ قَوْلًا آنِفًا مَا سَمِئْتُ مِنْهُ مَا سَمِئْتُ مِنْهُ قَطْ he said, I have just heard from Muhammad a statement that in my whole life I've never heard something like that. Wallahi ma huwa bishir. Muhammad's statement is not music. It's not poetry. Wa ma huwa bil kahana. It is not magic and soothsaying. Wallahi la yakunanna li qawlihi alladhi sami'tu minhu nabawun azim. Verily, that thing that I've heard from Muhammad, Wallahi is going to have a great future. That thing, this statement that he's saying, is not something that we must idle with. He said, rajula wa mahuwa fihi. Leave that man alone. Abu Walid went to the Prophet Muhammad as an opponent, an enemy. He has come back to defend the Prophet Muhammad even though the man didn't accept Islam. He said, rajula wa mahuwa fihi. Leave the man alone and whatever he's in. In Yadhar al Arab, for Mulkuhu Mulkukum, where is Zuhu is Zukum. If he is able to overcome and overpower the Arabs, they understand his power and might and kingdom will be yours too. Well, in Tadhar alayhi in Arab. But then, if the Arabs are to conquer him or overpower him, then someone else has done the job for you. So don't touch Muhammad. That is when Abu Walid kept quiet. He didn't open his mouth again concerning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The message that he had. Al Walid ibn al Mughira. When he was asked about the Quran, when he went to hear the Quran, he wanted to hear the Quran. What is this message that Muhammad is saying? He went to hear, he went to listen to the Quran, and then he came back and then he said, Inna lahu la halawa. Mm, That statement is sweet. Wa inna alayhi la talawa. There is some reverence and importance over that message. That message has some reverence and importance. Some Mag some you know magnanimous big something if that is the right word. He said, well, inna hu la ya'lu wa la la ala. You see, this word is always going to conquer, as nothing is going to conquer this word. Abu this Walid ibn al-Mughira is the father of Khalid ibn Walid. He didn't accept Islam. When the Kufar of Mecca heard that Walid ibn Mughira, one of the most respected people in Mecca, has praised the Quran like this, Abu Jahl went to him and said, Hey, uncle, you are destroying what we are building. You are amongst the people who is being respected in Mecca, and you are here now praising this statement of Muhammad. You are crippling what we are building. So say something about Muhammad that is going to be more detrimental to him than helping him. And then he made some statements, very sad statements. He said, Muhammad is a magician. He turned that statement upside down. And Almighty Allah sent some verses upon him. Read those verses in Surah al -Mutafir. We are not going to explain those verses. Another example of, you know, the miraculous nature of the message. Labid ibn Rabia is one of the form, for, famous or foremost poets in the history of, you know, the Arabic language. Totally. He has a mu'allaka. A mu'allaka is poetry that they've written and then it was, you know, pasted on the walls of Kaaba. 
if your poetry is you know so marvelous and fantastic they pasted your poetry onto the walls of the Kaaba. those of you who know al muallaqat al ashara and muallaqat saba you know them they pasted it muallaqat they pasted them on the walls of the Kaaba. this guy's poetry was up to another level so his poet his poems were posted onto the walls of the Kaaba for people to read and enjoy look like a notice board so one day he himself he wrote a poem that was attacking the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the quran and something like that and then he wrote it and then he pasted it on the wall of Kaaba. so people were reading and they were happy now yes someone is coming to challenge the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then a muslim wrote some few verses of the quran and then he also pasted it near the poem of labid ibn rabia labid ibn rabia entered the Kaaba and then he saw a, a post near his post like facebook we've pasted and someone also pasted so he went to decided to read who has posted something near his post is it a comment by someone you know you want to read comments on facebook something like that so he went and then he read these verses of the quran written next to his poem and then he screamed what is this who has written this and then the kufar were like labid what's wrong what's wrong he said i've read something something has been written here this is this is this is beyond imagination they what is this he pointed the parchment there is oh this is the quran that muhammad has been disturbing us with in mecca he said show me where he is so he was he went to the prophet Muhammad and then the prophet Muhammad read the quran to him he sat down quietly when he raised his head up he said ashadu allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah he accepted islam during the time of umar ibn khattab umar called him and said ya labid come and recite some of your poems for us he came and then he, he started reciting surah al-baqarah umar said no i didn't say recite surah al-baqarah i didn't say recite the quran i said recite for us some of your poems you are a famous poet he said ya amir al-mu'minin since the day that i learned the quran I don't think I'll be able to read anything else apart from the Quran. No, I can't. Nothing will make me read. We'll leave the Quran and read something else. No, I can't. So please bear with me. Poetry and poems, I've put them aside. Let's look at some examples of the message that these people had and then it hates their hearts. We call it atisaq bayna lafz wal ma'na. That there is a correlation between the word and then the meaning that the word, you know, gives in the verses of the Quran. If there is a particular word in the Quran, if, if you substitute that word with its synonym, that synonym will not give the exact meaning that this synonym is giving. If there is a word in the Quran and then you said let's take this word and then let's bring some another word that has the same meaning within that context the new word will not be able to give the same meaning let's do for example about musa he was in the city khaifan he was fearful he was being careful looking left right but then with careful with, with care and caution because they were looking for him to capture him so yatarakab was the word that was being used if you change the word yatarakab and then you use yatalafat no it will give that meaning yatalafat only means he's just looking right and center it might not even be out of fear or being cautious but then the word yatarakab means he was looking left right and center and then he was being cautious about the fact that no someone might see him so a correlation between the word and then its meaning another example about musa and khidr for what did he have and you read and then they found a wall in the city the wall wants to young cub it wants to collapse young cub if you say yaka it doesn't work 
Uh, yes, coat. No, no, no. Young cup. You can feel that young cup. It's it, it's 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 going to fall exactly. Young cup is going to fall. For them, them alayhim rabbuhum. You can feel that it is a punishment for them, 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 them. You see, you find out yes. The words relates the meaning, and you can feel for them, them alayhim. Bal nakrif bil haki al al baatil fayadu maguhu. You see, fayad the mug, and it tramples upon it. So you 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 feel the meaning from the word itself. You wouldn't have to, you know, think to know the word. The moment the word is coming out, you are feeling the meaning straightforward. Another example: Hudhud wajik tuke min saba in binaba. Wajik tuke bi saba min saba binaba. Wajik tuke min saba binaba. Naba means information. So if you say what it took him in Saba in Bihabar, no, it doesn't it doesn't match. Khabar also means information, news. But then within the context of the verse, what it took him in Saba in Binaba, Naba, Saba, Naba, it, it moves. So these people, when they listen to these things and then the way the words are moving, they were like, No, a human being cannot sit down and create this. This is beyond understanding. So, Jazul Bayani, you know, the miraculous message of the Quran. We have about two or three more Ijaz that we are going to look at. And uh, we have almost about 10 more minutes to go. And then we don't want to spend much of your time. I know it's almost 6 p.m. back home in Ghana. And then you are preparing for Iftar. So, I think. And the next one to we'll have to have about 20 minutes to talk about it. The judicial miracle of the Quran, the legislative miracle of the Quran. We have to take about almost 30 minutes to talk about it. And uh, we have about 10 more minutes to go. So I think with all due respect, we'll stop here because we also have Ijaz al Ilmi, scientific miracles of the Quran. Are there science? Is there science, scientific miracle in the Quran? That the Quran contains science, S, C, I, E, N, C, E. Does the Quran contain science? And what are the scholars saying about that? We also have Ijaz al Ghaibi, that is the unseen miracles of the Quran, miraculous nature of the Quran. So, we, inshallah, tomorrow we'll look at Ijaz al Tashri'i, you know, the legal miracles or the judicial legal miracles of the Quran. Today we've looked at, you know, the, you know, uh, miraculous nature of the message of the Quran that has made these people from listening to the quran they realize that no this book is not a book that must be joked with so they accepted islam why is it that the quran doesn't have any effect on us and why is it that someone might ask a question if the quran is this powerful why is it that muslims are still in tatas muslims are still in problems is because muslims left the quran and then we are following something else and that's it that's it we all have, you know, our whims and caprices that we are following at the detriment of the Quran. That is why we are the most disunited and most disjointed ummah on the surface of the earth. We are supposed to be the most powerful, the most respected. We ruled the world for 1,000 years, from the mountains of Mongolia in the east to the doors of Paris in the west, from the mountains of Siberia in the north to the Indian Ocean in the south. Even Harun al-Rashid, he said, if he's one day he was he was he was given khutbah Harun al Rashid read about Harun al Rashid and then you understand where we came from and where we are now read the likes of Harun al Rashid read about the likes of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz read about them and then you really understand what went wrong Harun al Rashid when he sees a cloud he tells her oh cloud you can release your rain here or anyway, but don't worry, wherever you release your rain, taxes from that place will come to this office here. There's, that's how big the kingdom was, and that's how powerful the kingdom was, and that's how structured the kingdom was. And the likes of Harun al-Rashid, they were not saints, they were not Sahaba, they came a century or so after the Sahaba, after the Prophet Muhammad But then their names are still written with golden on golden tablets because they held the Quran 
And if Muslims, especially back home in Ghana, if we really, really, really want to be relevant and important, we need to hold the Quran. I only say this with all due respect. The problems that we are facing as a community is that we've left the Quran aside. We only pay lip service to the Quran. That's it. I saw a video of a man who was reading the Quran and I wept. That's what we do to the Quran. And then we expect the blessings of the Quran. We expect the blessings reading the Quran like that. It's not by force if you don't know how to read. Listen to someone who knows. If you can't take the Quran and read, listen to someone who knows how to read the Quran. You get the reward for listening to the Quran. Instead of you reading something that is not the Quran and then claiming you are reading the Quran. I always say this. Let's hold steadfast to our religion as Muslims in this country. In our country back home, Ghana. Let's hold steadfast to the Quran. Not only reading or paying lip service to it, but working with it. In our marriage ceremonies, make use of the Quran. In our naming ceremonies, make use of the Quran. In our funerals, make use of the Quran. In our business transactions, make use of the Quran. In our relationships with our wives and our husbands, make use of the Quran. With our neighbors, make use of the Quran. But the moment we rejected the Quran from our system, that's it. We lost the power and the respect that the non-Muslims had for us in our country. And you know it very, very well. 15, 20 years ago, the non-Muslims in Ghana saw us as angels. They called our forefathers peripheral, meaning just people. That is where we got the name Pepe for. But now, are we peri peri for? No, we are not. The, the Ashanti kingdom has some of its history written in Arabic language because they trusted the Muslims who came at that time to even let them write their history for them. The Sarakinzango of Kumasi has a seat with the Asantihini. You know it. It is not something that I'm creating. Where did we go wrong? Where did we lose this respect that the non-Muslims had for us? Because we ended up cheating them. Their forefathers told them that we are peri peri for. They look at us now and then they see something different. Previously, it was very, very difficult for a non-Muslims, for a non-Muslim to have an illegitimate relationship with a Muslim girl in the Zongo. Previously, 20, 30 years ago, a non-Muslim to have an illegitimate relationship with a Muslim girl, to even impregnate her, no, haram, it can't happen. But now it is something which is going on. Why? Because we are also taking their daughters illegitimately. We are also fornicating with their girls. So if they come and then they are fornicating with our, with our girls, you think it is by chance or by coincidence. That is what we are doing. Wallahi, an elderly man told me this in one of the Zungos in Ghana. I want to mention the place. There was a problem that they've realized that they've realized that the Muslim girls are getting pregnant without marriage and then the guys responsible for the pregnancy are on Muslim boys. So they came in and they were discussing that in that particular zongo. I went for dawa, and then they were discussing that. How is that going to? How is it possible that our Muslim girls are being impregnated by non-Muslim boys in our homes? Not through marriage. It doesn't mean that getting being impregnated outside marriage by a Muslim boy is right. But then for a non-Muslim, it's more dirty. And then the man told him that it is what you've sowed, that is what you are reaping now. They were like, how? He said, how many of you in this zongo do not have illegitimate children with non-Muslim women in their neighborhoods? And they all bowed down their heads. How many of you? He said, how many of you? He said, even me. 
he himself he was he said even he himself he has a child with a non-muslim woman there in their community and everybody knows it so he said this is what we saw 20 years ago that is what we did we went there because we had money because we were paying for allergy we had money and then this non-muslim woman came to buy from us or they need credit or anything like that we use them now they are children their sons are coming back into our communities to revenge what we did to their mothers and then most of us refused to accept responsibility of those pregnancies i wept that day So the chaos and the confusion you are having in our communities is because Muslims have paid only lip service to the Quran and then we close our eyes. That's it. We don't care. Al-Muslimun al-yawma hamuhum butunuhum wa qiblatuhum nisa'um la ya'lamuna min al-islami illa asma wa la min al-mushafi illa rasma The problem of the day that we have as Muslims is our tummies. All that we think is food. Eat, 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 eat. That's it. Wa to whom nisa um, and then our our women, our sense of direction. Kibla. La ya alamu ne min al Islam illasma. We don't know anything about Islam now except the name Islam. That is what is apparent. Wala min al mushaf illa rasma. We don't know anything about the Quran except what is written there. The writing of the Quran. That's it. So the haiba, the al, the pa, the respect that our forefathers commanded in terms of their relationship with these non-Muslims, we've lost it. We've thrown it down the garbage. We are in them in the ghettos, smoking the weed and selling all the drugs. You think they'll respect you? Previously, if you speak Hausa, that is it. The non-Muslim will give up. But now you are speaking, he's speaking. Because your power your power that the Almighty Allah is giving you, you've thrown it away down the drain because you refuse to hold steadfast to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are having a marriage ceremony and then you, you, you mix it up with haram. You call the scholars to come in the morning to come and read Fatiha, to read Dua for you in your, in your marriage in the morning. In the afternoon, before you send this, you know, this bride to her husband, you parade her on the streets of the community naked. She dances to all kinds of haram tunes. And it is the non-Muslims who come and 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 and, and, and you know, orchestrate or what play the music for you. Previously, that's what they did. Abelade and co. That's what they did. You threw away your Islamic culture and then you imported someone else's culture and then you are complaining now. Why should you complain? You don't have to complain. You have to keep quiet and then suffer the consequences or change for the better. You, 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 you invite all these spinners to come and play haram music for a lady who is supposed to complete the half of the that day, half of her religion is complete. Oh, that day, because when you get married, half of your religion is complete. 50% of your religion is complete when you get married. On the day that you complete half of your religion, you've invited haram before you enter that half. You bring in all kinds of music. You go in for all kinds of loans just to impress to impress that's just to impress people not because you want to impress the almighty allah you go and invite different spinners one marriage you have at least four different spinners spinning and blaring music out disturbing the community each one of that is about 500 ghana cd that you go and pay and then our women will dance away their dignities on the streets of our community with a man sitting behind the stereo and then holding a mic and then saying, Ashika Fudu Fudu, Amaria Kina Haske, Amaria Kina Belinkin, Belinkin Kiga, Amaria, Ye Kukada, Kukada, Kukada. 
and then our women will jump onto the street. Hey, and then they are dancing their dignities away on the streets. And you think that such a woman who dances her dignities out dignities away on the street will have the mind and then the focus to prepare the next generation for us. If our women are only enticed by music and indomie, you think we have a future? If, if, if our young boys are enticed with gambling and betting and fraud, you think we have a future? We live in communities whereby the well-to-do guys, men or prominent people in the community are the ones hiring their properties for super betting companies to come and hire and then cause problems in our communities. Come into our Zongo communities and see how many super betting centers we have. And then ask yourself, who are the people who have rented out those buildings to them for them to, 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 to be destroying us? We have chiefs in the community. We have opinion leaders in the community. We have sheikhs in the community. We have politicians in the community. What are we doing about that? How many drug dens do we have? Now, the drugs that are being used in our communities is open. It's not a secret. It's open wide. Everybody is doing drugs now on the street. Go to Nima Mamu at 8 p.m. and then you weep. 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds are smoking. They are doing drugs and then they have with them weapons. If you speak, they will shoot you or they will stab you. And then when we speak, you say we don't respect elders. Which kind of elder are you when behind your window someone has opened a den for, for, for thieves and smoking? What kind of opinion leader are you? If you cannot correct what is happening behind your house, can you come and correct what is happening in my home? You spent 500 Ghana CDs on inviting those people to come and play haram music and then your wife will dance her dignity away. 500 times 4 is 2,000 Ghana CDs. Let's say in the community, on the average, every weekend we have 10, only 10 marriages. 2,000 by 10 is 20,000 Ghana CDs. If you don't understand, let me make it into the old cities. You spend on an average on dancing and merrymaking alone in your marriage ceremony, one marriage, you spend 20 million inviting spinners to come and spin. If Nima, mom will be alone, there is 10 marriages in a weekend, 2,000, 20 million by 10 is 200 million. So in our communities on the average, we spend 200 million every weekend on dancing alone. In a month, 200 million times four is 800 million. 80,000 Ghana CDs. 80,000 Ghana CDs. That's what you spend on dancing. About $20,000 in a month. 800 million. Within 10 months, from January to October, you've spent 8 billion on dancing alone. <laughs> 8 billion. Within 10 months, 8 billion dancing alone. Ghana cities, 800 million Ghana cities, or 800,000 Ghana cities, 8 billion. Within 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, you spent 80 billion on dancing alone, 80 billion on dancing alone, 8 million Ghana cities. About $2 million. Or less than two million dollars within 10 years you don't have schools you don't have hospitals you don't have anything to boast of 
But then the community has the audacity with pomposity and pageantry to spend 80 billion within a 10 year period on dancing alone. The community is sick in the head. And then we are waiting for the politicians to come and help us. Which politician will come and help you in the Zongo? When the only thing we've made them to understand is food that we want. That's it. The politicians, maybe it's because we are in social distancing now in Ramadan. I don't know if they visited. Previous years, when they come to you, they bring you only rice and sugar. And far from that kind of city, that's it. That's the only thing they bring you. And then you go haywire in the mock. Salud al Karim. The security bag with you. That's it. That what agenda do they have for you? No, because you've made them understand that nothing. Even if you have you have something to say, the only thing you say is Allah Honorable Your Excellency. Uh, is it this our father? Uh, he's about 80 years now. He has not gone to Mecca. So uh, we, we want Mecca seat for 80 year old man. One of his legs is in the grave. The other is in the dunya. You want to send him to Haji to go and kill him. He goes to Mecca and then he comes back and then he joins line for public toilet. That's it. That's the kind of life we are living. When we say, when we talk, you say we don't respect the elders. No, we respect the elders, but these are the problems that we are facing. Quietly, and then we need to work upon them. I've spent much time on this, you know, late editorial. So tomorrow we'll look at Tashri, uh, Jazz Tashri. If you don't have any questions, thank you very much for passing by. Abdul Samad, mashallah, barakallah, fiqh. Harun Nasari, Harun, thank you too very much for listening to us. Sister Ruya Muhammad, I have answered your two questions. I don't know, maybe you came late, but at the beginning of the session, I answered your questions. And Sheikh Anna, thank you very much for passing by. Yusuf Abdul Karim, Jazakallah Khairan. May Almighty Allah safeguard all of us. So thank you very much for being with us. If you have any questions, I don't think you have any questions. Because if you are, then you will have typed. But inshallah, may Allah also increase you in knowledge. Thank you for today too. Thank you. Barakallah Fiqh. So see you again tomorrow. Uh, 5 p.m. GMT, inshallah. 1 p.m., you know, Eastern Time U.S. Those of us listening to us in the United States, 1 p.m. Eastern Time is 5 p.m. GMT, and I think 8 p.m. Makkah time. Thank you very much for passing by. Jazakumullah khair and assalamu alaikum.